This episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast is driven by Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy. CGA is the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource. They've got over 160 instructional videos, including everything you need to take your seven week old puppy to a finished gun dog. Visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com to sign up for their free preview module and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, episode 139. This week on the show, we're joined by our good buddy, Barton Ramsey. We're talking summer dog training and what you can do to maximize the off-season with your pup. All right, welcome to this, the 139th episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, where you're on-demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting. This week brought to you by Yukonuba. Out in the field, how you've prepared determines how you'll perform. With balanced fat and protein to support peak conditioning, Yukonuba premium dog food enhances strength, energy, and endurance. When the pavement ends and the truck doors finally swing open, you and your dogs are ready for anything. Strong, focused, ready for anything. That's a Yukonuba dog. If you're new to the program, you can head over to hpoutdoors.com. You can check out all the past episodes over there. You can also stop by our discounts tab and see how you can save some cash with uh, a lot of companies that support our program. If you're on social media, head over to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find us over there. You can find us on Facebook by also searching our Facebook listeners group, chat with a bunch of like-minded hunters in there, and also my co-host, Dan Hershka. Dan, what's up, man? No, good to have you back, brother. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this episode, like you said, we're talking a little summer dog training. Had Kimber out today. Um, got some water work in and she was loving it. And I tell you, I tell you what, man, for being over 10 years old, she's, she's still getting after it and makes me happy. And, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's fun. It's fun times. Yeah. I think a lot of guys, we talk about this with Barton, but I think a lot of guys are kind of in the same boat. They're, uh, you know, scratching the duck depression itch kind of thing with training with the dogs. And you see, you know, a lot of people, posting up pictures and kind of getting that time. So it's very cool. It's always good to see. I think just kind of as the summer gets going, a lot of people get more busy with vacations and things like that. So it seems like early in the summer, you see a lot of guys, you know, getting time in the field with their dogs. So it's also uh, real cool to check out. Um, so yes, we're joined by Barton Ramsey this week. We're going to talk about a variety of different things with him. Um, you know, we talk about some things that are specifically focused on summer and heat and things like that, but also some other good tips for kind of this time of the year and, and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I think it's a good chat. You know, we always have enjoy having Barton on the show and uh, he, you know, every time he's on, it's always one of the, you know, always uh, one of the most downloaded episodes we get, you know, a lot of, a lot of the content that Barton brings to the show is very, very popular. So we're always very uh, fortunate and uh, lucky to have him on whenever he's available. So I have no doubt that this week will also be, uh, you know, very much along the same lines. Yes, sir. Yeah. You know, like I, like I say in the episode, there's a lot of questions that come up now in groups because, you know, it's not hunting and, and it's really people try and get dialed in. So the little things people are working on. And then I just had a few questions about honoring and, you know, a lot of guys just have one dog. So I wanted to know, you know, what he would suggest for guys as far as their dog honoring another dog when they go out on a hunt and if they, you know, hadn't trained with another dog or another person and, and, uh, I guess some of the challenges that come with that. So like you said, we hit a ton of things, you know, sending dogs to trainers and, you know, what people should be working with and some great tips as far as the water and evaporation and cooling them off when they're in hot water. So, uh, great, great chat like always. No doubt. And before we get into that, we'll just want to take a minute real quick to thank Gunner Kennels. They're engineered for your dog, designed for travel, and built for your peace of mind. The G1 series of kennels has set a new industry standard and put Gunner in a category all its own. 
Gunner Kennels was started to protect your pet, and it cont- continues to be at the center of everything that they do. They're dedicated to building the best and safest pet travel crate on the market because man's best friend deserves man's best kennel. Check out their G1 series of kennels and accessories at GunnerKennels.com. Also, thank you to 737 Duck and Goose Calls, original design, select grade components, superior sound, and unparalleled service. 737 takes exceptional pride in producing the finest quality, best-built premium calls on the market today. They're made right here in America and offered only direct to consumers through their website. Shipping in the U.S. is always free, and international orders are also now accepted online. 20-day money-back guarantee and a lifetime warranty accompanies every call purchased. 737.calls lead the flock. And as we mentioned, head over to the Discounts tab on the HP Outdoors website. Find out how you can save a little cash on a Gunner Kennel uh, or a Gunner Kennel accessory and also some 737 uh, calls or, uh, you know, swag or whatever they got. So two companies that support the show, so support them if you're in the market for some gear. All right, Dan. Unless you got one more thing, let's go ahead and uh, roll uh, this interview with Barton Ramsey. Anything else? I'll save it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Joining us this week on the show, he's certainly no stranger to our program. He's number one in your program and number one in your heart. Mr. Barton Ramsey, how you doing, man? Number one in your heart. <laughs> You've really narrowed our audience. Uh, I'm doing well, doing well. Good man. Glad to glad to have you back on the show for another round. And we got a couple of things that we want to touch base on this week. Kind of some things that we think uh, you know a lot of guys are probably going through this time of year, and uh, hit on a couple of those topics. But you know, I'm kind of curious. Uh, what's a what's a normal kind of summer day around the kennel like for you right now? Sort of. Uh, you know, the, the, I'm sure the temperatures are cranking up down, down your way and things like that. So, uh, what's, what's kind of new at the kennel these days? It is interesting that you should ask. Um, I went to New Zealand a few weeks ago and, uh, just through a series of events on my trip to New Zealand, uh, my time with my, my kennel manager working here, Howell, as many of you would know who've been here, uh, kind of came to an end. So he finished out his two weeks and left a little while ago. And so uh, the days are a little different this summer than they normally would be without him here. Mm-hmm. Uh, we definitely feel his absence. So I've got an intern here, my cousin Stone uh, Ramsey, great kid. And uh, man, just a lot. We've had a little cool front come through the last few days, which is awesome uh but man we're up letting the dogs out early um let them run cleaning kennels if we need it uh filling water bowls and taking care of puppies we have several litters on the ground because we 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 had a long period of time from basically early february until late april where we didn't have any puppies born at all there are no puppies here at at the kennel at all from from in that time span which is sort of weird so we Use that time to kind of get ahead, get everything really clean and organized. And then now we've had uh, several litters born really at all of our campuses. But here at my place, there's several on the ground. So that takes a lot of work in the morning to make sure that they're fed, that the kennels are cleaned, um, that everyone has water. And then, uh, man, I try to balance my day between responding to emails and social media and handling all of that, training a handful of dogs, uh, teaching Stone kind of what to do around the kennels with dogs and then hanging out with my kids because they're out of school. So we've been spending a lot of family time working on our swimming pool. We drained it this year and we're trying to get a couple things done before we fill it up. Hopefully we'll be filling it up tomorrow. Uh, so yeah, it, it stays busy. We let them out about six thirty seven in the morning and then we let them out one more time about 7, 7.30 in the evening. So between that time, it's just a lot of dog work. And before I ask you about the awesome hunt that you had in New Zealand, I would like to say happy Father's Day to both of you because this will be coming out on Monday right afterwards. So, gentlemen, well done. Yeah, yeah. back at you. Like I what? appreciate it. Yeah, so <laughs> the the New Zealand hunt, man. What? Um, just talk about that trip. I know you killed some great birds over there. Uh, was it yeah. a black black swan? Yeah, I did kill a black swan. Actually, co-killed it with uh, Callum, I believe, was the other guy that shot it. Um, I think he was the one that pulled the trigger, but it was several shells to knock that thing down. I definitely slowed it down and spun it around for him. Um, 
man, I went over there for what they their New, New Zealand um, National Gun Dog Association's Retriever Week. But as part of the trip, I also booked um, a flight down to the South Island when I first arrived in New Zealand to spend a few days hunting with Jeff Irvine and his his friends, which was man, it was a blast. They showed me a great time. They do things differently, but also sort of the same. And, uh, man, we hunted a river there. I can't remember the name of it, but it's the river that the hobbits floated down in the wine barrels when they escaped. Uh, and we were about a mile and a half, two miles down from that. And mm. I told him, I said, I want to shoot a pukiku, which they call pooks, which is like a weird, weird bird, like a pheasant duck. I mean, almost like the equivalent of our coot, but they're all over the place. They're kind of black and blue. And, and I told him, I really want to shoot a paradise shell duck and a black swan. And we didn't shoot any pukikus on the first day, but we shot um, 50 paradise shell ducks, killed our limit, and shot a black swan right at the end of the day and a couple of mallards on that river, which was apparently it's pretty rare to kill. They call them parries over the water. Usually they're killed in a, in a field, which they call a paddock. And uh, we didn't hunt them in the paddocks. We hunted them over the river at one of their little midday kind of loafing spots. And, man, we, we had a blast. It was really, really fun uh, shooting ducks and then went up to the North Island, trained dogs, and taught retriever training seminars for a few weeks. Or, sorry, a few days. Felt like a few weeks. A lot of work. Super great people. Enjoy meeting everybody. Jeff's good stuff. He'll be over here hunting this fall. Uh, his daughter, Holly, uh, will blow in the in some of the duck calling competitions that we have over here, especially the meat calling competitions, and crushes it at that. And they're, they're really great people. It's really fun to make new friends and – Hunt something different. I was going to say, are you able to bring any of those birds home? Yeah, so I didn't bring them, but I left them with Jeff in his freezer. So I have a pair of paradise shell ducks that I'm going to hopefully do a dead mount with. Beautiful nice. ducks. So, yeah. Big ducks. They're actually about the size of a, a Ross goose, maybe almost the size of a lesser Canada goose. They're, wow. they're, they're huge. Yeah, really, really big ducks. They make kind of crazy sounds, like a, like a cooing sound, and then they... Uh, they decoy really well. So it was, it was really fun. Mm. Awesome. Did Very you cool. take any of your dogs over? No, I would have loved to have done that. But New Zealand is two islands and they don't have really any like a lot of bugs. They don't have like, I mean like sicknesses. They don't, it's a very protected island. It's a safe place. And to bring a dog over, you've got a, pretty extensive amount of health testing and then you also have like a some blood work that has to be done and then you have a quarantine time and i really am not into doing any of that with any of mine i don't think red would appreciate being stuck over there for 30 30 days waiting on me so no i didn't take any dogs i did work with them with their dogs especially in the north i went up and worked with the actually several of the retriever clubs from all over the country north and south and uh it was a blast just working with them and they actually have some cool field trials going on and a lot of their dogs are bred from similar lines as some of our dogs so it was it was a really fun time really awesome food to be honest we ate fresh home cooked meals almost every night and it was whew, the food was delicious mm. awesome well, let's shift gears and, and stop talking about how amazing your last couple of weeks have been and how, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, talk a little bit about dog training. And, you know, I think probably, um, you know, I think my, my news feed, you know, Instagram and everything else has been dominated, like completely dominated with dog, dog training of all sorts and varieties, um, you know, unlike any other time of the year. So again, I, I don't hunt my dog. Uh, so I, I'm not into that, uh, you know, I'm not in that part of the off season, but it seems like for guys that have retrievers, you know, this is like, they're really kicking it into gear and they're, you know, um, brushing up on skills and teaching new things and doing trials and all this kind of good stuff. Uh, so, you know, curious as to what your opinion is and your thoughts are and, you know, I have to imagine it would kind of vary a little bit uh, depending on the situation. But, um, you know, what, in your opinion, are some good things to be kind of, uh, you know, zoning in on this time of year? And, you know, maybe are there things that you think that uh, guys could potentially you know, maybe inadvertently overdo or spend too much time focusing on things that uh, may not you know, be worthwhile as much or whatever? Um, just kind of you know, your thoughts on this time of the year and what are some great things to be focusing on with, you know, with your pup? Yeah, really a couple tracks there. If you've got a young pup and you're looking forward to the first or maybe even the second season, 
this is a really good time to jump ahead. I think a lot of people will sort of do like elementary stuff through the summer while it's hot, sort of take it easy. And really you can get ahead on steadiness on all sorts of different work and drills in the summertime so that in September you're not like freaking out like, oh man, it's almost, you know, season's almost here. Is my dog ready? And you try to do these cram sessions. Um, I would set a goal with your puppy or your gun dog to say, hey, whatever I want to see my dog doing in like, let's just say September of this year, let's try to have it done by early August. You know, like let's let's set a goal and, and work to be ahead of the curve rather than trying to play catch up because dogs don't learn very well that way. Um, but I do see people, you know, overdoing stuff. It's the days are longer. You've got more time. It's hot out. And I see a lot of people just running retrieve after retrieve after retrieve and just wearing their dogs out. Uh, and so what I tell people in the summertime when it's warm and you have extra time, but it's hot outside and you have access to water. My biggest thing when I go out training is to make sure that every single retrieve counts. Um, I don't go out and just run a whole bunch of retrieves. If I'm going to keep my dog in shape, then I let them do some free running. I let them run alongside me while I run or swim while we're out boating or whatever it is. Um, but as far as retrieving goes, because it's hot, you want to keep them mentally focused. I would say, hey, look, what do I want to work on right now? Is it lining? Is it casting? Is it marking through cover? Whatever it is, and make sure that every single retrieve counts. You're not just doing a bunch of um, needless retrieves in the in the heat uh, to make them bored and, and less interested in work, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd be working on in the summertime, trying to get ahead, but also trying to make sure you do it smart and don't waste a lot of retrieves. I have a question for, I guess a, it's a really broad view, but would you suggest someone, say someone um, that doesn't hunt a ton or in large groups and maybe, you know, they might max out at say 10 birds a hunt versus somebody that, um, you know, might run a, a lodge or something like that and, and they kill, you know, 40, 50 birds a hunt. Would you recommend... I guess, is there a ratio that you would put on retrieves for someone running big hunts like that versus someone that runs maybe, you know, 10 good retrieves on a good day? Does that make sense? I don't know if, I, yeah, I don't know if I would change very much other than possibly the conditioning, you know. If a hunt is different than training. Dogs can stay, dogs can stay focused much better on a hunt because there's just so much action. They're so interested in what's going on. Um, so the biggest thing about the guys that go out, like if we take dogs out on conservation snow goose or just some of the hunts where there's just a lot being killed, the biggest thing is just making sure that those dogs are conditioned well. In the summertime when it's hot, like it is down here, that happens in water. Um, we send a lot of dogs, um, you know, on long water retrieves. And when the water gets hot later in the summer, we do a quick water retrieve at the beginning and then do everything on land. And so we're really just trying to make sure the dog's conditioning stays up. That tends to be the downfall of, those do of what you know dogs will experience when they're on one of those hunts where there's just tons and tons of birds to pick up. Um, but no, for the dogs that are just picking up 10 birds, I would say you know one thing that's very important for those dogs is learning to be steady and quiet and still for a long time. Because you know usually if you're out and you're only killing 8 to 10 birds on a hunt, it's pretty normal, I think, for a lot of waterfowlers. That usually doesn't happen in 15 minutes. Usually you're out there for, you know, two or three hours, and there's some pretty significant breaks in the action. And so for those dogs in the summertime, one of the things that we like to do is we have a lot of barbecues. We cook a whole lot. We like to put the dogs on a mow marsh or a place board somewhere and just teach them it's okay to be still, to sit while action's going on around you, uh, while people are talking, while guys are hanging out, whatever it is. And so we kind of integrate that into their training where there's, you know, they're learning to just sit somewhere, be still, turn it off, don't be anxious, uh, wait on us to give you a command sort of thing. You know, I was actually thinking uh, while you were telling that story about, you know, the water and as it gets warmer. And as you were saying that, um, that was going to be like my little, my literally my next question about that. And I, I'm, I'm curious if you could just expound on that a little bit, because I, I think people associate, you know, putting the dogs in water as helping them cool off and allowing them to do more work. But, you know, as the summer gets along, you know, water is heat up and it's not cooling them down, obviously. Um, 
do you have like a rule of thumb as far as like water temperature where when it's it gets to the point where it's you know you just do that one in the morning or the first retrieve in the water and then the rest of the stuff's on on land uh where where guys could kind of use that as sort of a judge to understand when maybe they want to shift and kind of do something similar yeah so what people don't understand is they think the water is going to cool the dog off but the water will often be you know 95 plus degrees and it just is you know, incinerating the dogs. So for us, um, when the water is warm, we like to, you know, dogs cool by evaporation. I'm not sure if people know that. So the way they cool is by the water evaporating off of their skin, off of their tongue, that sort of thing. So if your dog that overheats, we've, we've even said on HP before, you want to get water on the, the areas that have the most exposed skin, like their tongue, their pads, uh, their stomach. And so we always like to start in the water because even if you're training in the heat of summer, they're going to be evaporating that water as they're running land retrieves. But when you start to run really long swims, the dogs can't evaporate anything when they're in the water. And so they're kind of baking. And as they're swimming, their body temp's getting up. They're, they're in an anaerobic state and they're not evaporating anything. And the water is so warm that it is actually heating them up. And then they got to turn around and come back. And so I think that's one of the biggest risks for a dog having a heat stroke is thinking that they're cooling off because they're on a long swim when in actuality their body temperature is rising. So you want to be very careful. I mean, you're not going to have a thermometer out and check the temperature of the water, but you guys, and especially in the south, everybody knows when it gets hot. I mean, I can remember being a kid and and wakeboarding down here in July and August and getting in, feeling like you're getting in a hot tub, you know, in the river. And so with that sort of stuff, you just want to be careful. Get a dog wet and then run them on the land. Let them evaporate it off. And then try to run as early in the morning and late in the evening as possible. I think that's a a really great point that a lot of people probably don't know or think about. So very nice. What what is your feeding schedule like, you know, when you're training early in the morning? Are you giving them some kibble before you go out or how are you working that? Yeah, dogs work best on an empty stomach stomach um so you know it's it's better to not feed right before you train i typically feed in the afternoon um between two and five really uh if we are going to train in the evening time then we'll if we know we're going to train in the evening time then we'll go ahead and do a mid-morning feeding instead and that way they'll at least have six eight hours before we train um, but preferably, I like to feed them about two to three hours after we work them, uh, at least. So my my biggest preference is feed them in the mid afternoon, train them the next morning, and then feed them the next afternoon. Um, with hunting, it's a little different. I think we've talked about that before. But you want to give them a little bit if it's a you know if it's freezing cold ice water, give them something to burn um, to keep body temp and body heat up and that sort of thing but with training especially in the summer we, we knock our food down significantly in the summer too because it's so hot there's not burning uh you know i think a lot of people will wonder why their outside dogs start getting really skinny in the winter time and they, they think it has to do with the work and typically it just has to do with the fact that their body has to work extra to stay warm uh, and in the summertime they can just lay around our dogs sleep most of the day so they're lazy so we cut the food back um significantly which is helpful for training and all that yeah so um man i was gonna ask something and i think i just i just blanked on what i I was gonna ask go ahead dan i I can go back because because you know you're talking about the oh oh, no i remember now i remember (laughs) it's completely relevant to what he just what he just answered though so i'm gonna jump back in here um so let's assume and i know we may get get into this a little bit in a minute but um let's assume a guy is getting his dog back from the trainer and, and maybe, maybe my question should be two parts. Uh, like, so if I, if I bring a, a dog to you that is started, right, I'm, I've worked with him or whatever, and he's at a certain phase and I've, I'm bringing you, him to you, uh, to start training, uh, how, how is it adjusted? Like, how is the feeding schedule adjusted if I've been doing something completely different than what you're going to do at the kennel for all of the dogs? And you know, how long does that process take to change over or does it change over? And then conversely, like if you've had my dog all, you know, for a couple months or however long and I come and get him and you're feeding him on one schedule and for whatever reason, maybe my work schedule doesn't permit that or whatever. Um, and I need to shift to something different. Um, how long should that, uh, conversion period take or is that something where you can kind of make it more of an abrupt change because the workload's going to change more consistent to that schedule for me 
Does that make sense? Yep. It's not difficult at all. They adjust really quickly. Um, you don't want to just like, so dogs can skip a meal and suffer much less than I think people realize. I think people get all worried like, oh, my dog missed his supper. He's going to be you know, sick and all that. It doesn't really affect them that adversely. Of course, they get hungry, but right. they're not, you know, they don't have a metabolism like us. They don't need to eat three times a day to feel normal. So um, I would rather skip than overload. So if you have a dog that ate one evening and he comes to your kennel and you're like, well, we feed in the mornings and I'd rather skip that meal than give them double what they should have in a 24 hour period. Um, but usually they adjust really well. I mean, you do have the people who are like, well, Fru Fru eats, you know, four times a day, with the, you know, <laughs> food just watered down with warm water and all that. And I'm like, all right, fine. They're going to eat once a day and they're going to eat all of it or we're going to pick it up. I saw a post online about that today and a guy was like, my dog, you know, he's, she stopped eating when she's outside. She wants to eat inside with me there or something like that. And it's like, all right, look, I put the food down, you eat it, you got it. 20 seconds to start eating. If you don't, if you just sniff it and walk away, then I pick it up. Next time you'll be hungry. And that may sound rude, but I mean, they learn very quickly that way. And we want dogs to be food driven. So hungry dogs actually learn better. Now you don't want them starving, of course. You want them in shape, fit, you know, healthy. But dogs that are hungry will learn better and work better. And especially with puppies, because you're trying to teach them with food. So um, I think most people that have my puppies would say, you know, they're, they come home pretty hungry. They eat ferociously. You know, we don't, I don't like a puppy to just sniff its food and walk away and that sort of stuff. So the adjustments are not that difficult. We make them. And, of course, anything that's under 10 months or so, we feed twice a day um, just to make sure they're growing properly, which is no problem. Uh, but once they get to that point, we, we quickly switch them over to once a day, and, and they adjust They adjust just right along with everyone else. They kind of get in. I give dogs about two weeks to get into the really like the routine of being at, at you know Camp Southern Oak, whatever it is. Um and, and then I tell people, once you get home, give them about two weeks and they'll be fully back adjusted to your lifestyle. I was going to come in with a question, you know, you're talking to, as far as during a barbecue or, or standing around, whatever it may be. And you, you know, you put them on place, let them learn the patience. Um, and I think it was actually Vandy camp was asking about high, you know, dogs with a high drive and, you know, what, what can people do to keep them from breaking and i know i know you guys were answering this online but i thought it was some good points that you made so um keeping dogs from breaking or even creeping and and really you know honoring the trainer there yeah yeah it's good if you especially you know there's a difference between training multiple dogs like i have vader and a dog named lincoln that i'm working right now and they're both young dogs they're about the same age maybe three four weeks apart similar size similar learning you know, stages and my cousin Stone and I are working both of them uh, really every day. And so I'm able to have one sit while the other one retrieves. And so they're learning very quickly. Oh, well, that's, it's his turn. When you have just one dog, it can be more difficult. But what I said in the comments to uh, Fanny Camp's post was, you know, the problem is not necessarily just that the dog wants to break or the dog, you know, leaves before he should or the dog is creeping. You have to ask well, why, what, what's going on at a foundational level. And the problem is the dog believes that when something flies through the air and hits the ground, it's his. So it's the same thing as, you know, the first time you bring a, a only child who's four or five to kindergarten or preschool and they take every kid's toy because all they know is, well, that toy is mine. It's my toy and they don't know how to share. So what you're doing essentially in training is what you want to do anyway is teach these dogs that not everything that flies through the air is yours to pick up. So it's a, it's a more of a basic philosophy of steadiness. Steadiness is more of a lifestyle than just a, a skill. And so teaching a dog just because food hits the ground, just because the kennel door opens, the car door opens, the crate door opens, just because something flies through the air and hits the ground does not mean that you get to go. You get to go when I say you go. And so if you sit, you get the reward. You teach them what you want. You want them to sit. And if they sit, you give them the reward, which is what they wanted all, you know, all along. So what I told David was pick up, you know, 50% of the retrieves yourself for a while. You know, bring your kid out and say, all right, we're going to do a little exercise. You're going to get every other one. And even if those are just 10, 12, 15 feet, your dog is even more tempted to break on the short ones. So between marks off the winger or the Versa or the Thunder Launcher, 
throw one or have your kid throw one. Your dog really wants to go get that one, have the kid go pick it up and then immediately reward the dog when they sit still, you know, good boy, as they sit and pet them on the head and then let them go on the next one. If they break, then, you know, have a lead on them, pull them on the lead, turn around, walk backwards about five feet, tell them to sit and make them sit again and then make them honor a few more times and then never let them go unless they're still. That's a big one. Like if your pup stands up, creeps, jumps forward, breaks three feet and comes back, don't send them like ever, ever, ever. And I think a lot of people do it anyway. And they're the dog, and then they wonder, you know, why is my dog, I'm not saying David's done this, but why is my dog breaking? Why is he creeping? Why is he doing that? Well, it's because he's done that and you gave him the reward anyway. And so he's learned, oh, I can do that and get away with it. So if I've got a dog and we throw a retrieve and this rear end comes two inches off the ground, he doesn't go. You know, if his front paw picks up, he doesn't go. Everything's got to stay glued to the ground and that's when you get to go. And let me further more on that. When do you stop um, doing any kind of treats or, you know, food is reward? You know, if they're if they are doing that and then they finally, you know, keep their butt on the ground. Is that I like generally a- stop doing treat rewards when their adult teeth come in and we start doing more formal gun dog work. Six, seven months, six months usually. Okay. And I will revisit treats. Um clicker and treat if I need to shape a behavior. So I have a dog, you know, if I have a dog come in and they're eight months old and they have a really awful heel, then I'll usually use treats and a clicker to fix it. Um, and then go back to retrieving. But I don't, I don't use a lot of retreats at all when I'm doing retrieving work, except for with like puppies in the parking lot, just playing around. Gotcha. Cause they'll, they'll come back thinking they're getting a treat and they'll drop the dummy. And I'd rather them hold it. And you can use treats for hold conditioning. That's a whole other conversation. But your timing has to be impeccable. Like you have to really know what you're doing. And so I try not to tell a lot of people to do that because they'll treat the dog too fast and the dog will come back and spit the dummy out and want the treat. Hmm. So, you know, one other thing I see come up a lot, uh, it seems like, and this does happen throughout the year, but it seems like maybe this time of year I, I notice it maybe a little bit more. But... A lot of guys seem to be posting about, um, you know, their puppies or, you know, the, their dogs just kind of uh, don't have the desire that they sort of maybe expect or maybe they hope or, um, you know, whatever it is. Like if once they once they get their their dog, um, you know, uh, picked up and stuff like that. And, you know, I, I know we've talked about this to some to some extent, um, but I almost kind of feel like it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you as the owner are so excited to get going and have like been watching, you know, Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy and whatever you're doing to like get ready to go. And you're all squared away. You've been spending all this cash on toys to you know, train with and all this stuff. And then the dog, you know, you know, you get the dog and it doesn't, you know, it's not responding the way that you hoped or dreamed or whatever it would. And guys get pretty, um, you know, pretty disappointed, like immediately. And they're like, Oh no, my dog like doesn't want to hunt or whatever. Um, I know we've talked about that on this show a little bit, but but kind of speak to that a little bit and kind of uh, maybe help some guys relax a little bit with uh, thinking that maybe they got a you know a dog that doesn't want to hunt necessarily. Yeah, no, it's good. I, I mean, I see this a lot with a lot of people. We have to tell people all the time, like slow down. People ask me even today, like, hey, give us an update on Vader, and I'm definitely working with him. But people are like, you know, how's he doing? And I'm like, man, if you guys saw Vader at six months and compared him to most of what you people are doing with your dog at six months, you would say, holy cow, this dog doesn't know anything, like nothing. And I'm just back here like, well, he's very well socialized. He absolutely lives to retrieve because he's only had probably 25 retrieves in his life. And he thinks it's the best thing ever when he rarely gets one. And I'm just not worried about being in a hurry. I think a lot of people get one dog that's their only dog i get it it's the project you want to work on it every day and they do so many tennis ball retrieves and the dog just becomes completely bored with it or they expect too much of a young puppy i've had dogs who didn't really care about retrieving until they were five or six months old some that were a little older than that they were just like not into it and then later on it kicked in uh, that's not to say that you may have a dog that doesn't care about retrieving. If you've got, you know, poor genetics or a dog that just wound up being a lemon, that does happen. It's just more rare than most people would think. Um, I would imagine your dog's just being a puppy. You know, a lot of times people wonder why their dog won't retrieve in the backyard. 
but it's the same backyard where the dog gets to run around, free play, and go to the bathroom. So the, in the dog's mind, you know, why are you asking me to do something structured when I come out here to play? This is not, you know, this is my play zone. And so, yeah, I think people get a little caught, too caught up in that stuff and too much in a hurry. And I would just encourage people to slow down. Let puppies be puppies. Let them enjoy their time. Let them chase a few tennis balls. Don't steady them. You know, a lot of people are like, my dog doesn't have much of a retrieve desire and seven months old and completely steady. And I'm like, man, that's just... Don't steady the dog. Let them run in. Don't overdo retrieves. Give them two or three at a time. And when they get really excited about it, put them up. That way, next time you get it out, they're super excited about it. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot to say on that. But the biggest part is just to slow down. Uh, don't don't get overly concerned at a young age. You know, some dogs are just late bloomers. I've had a dog in my kennel recently that I trained named Chevy. He's a stellar gun dog now. I can't wait to see him this season. But I'm telling you, at like nine months, I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I was worried. He wouldn't run through the mud. I, he, if he was in a bad mood, he'd get out and you could tell. It's like, this dog's not even going to work. And then something just clicked. At like 10 months old, he was like, all right, I'm ready. And just started crushing it. Went home when he was about 13, 14 months old for the summer. And, man, he was just perfect. He was everything I wanted him to be. So, yeah, I wouldn't freak out about it, uh, and I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't try to push the dog too hard, too fast. One of the main topics I wanted to talk to you about tonight was, was honoring. And, you know, you talked a little bit about having one dog versus having multiple dogs. And, you know, just in my mind, as a, as a one gun dog owner, um, how do you work on honoring if you don't have other dogs to train with? And most of the time, say a guy goes and he takes his dog to a friend's house or something like that. And immediately that dog is, you know, you want to get him some energy worn out. So you go and let them run around. And then every time you end up in the field, that dog just thinks it's playtime with another dog. So what are your, what are some tips there that guys can, can utilize? as far as, you know, coming into season? Yeah, so I think, you know, finding some guys to train with is super helpful. There's there's no real replacement for it. So finding a friend, getting on, you know, HP listeners group or some Facebook group like it and saying, hey, who's in my area? Can we train dogs? Even if it's just once a month, uh, can we train dogs together? Because even... Um, you know, even if you do all the steadiness work you can do on your own, you can't replicate the excitement that comes when a dog sees another dog run out to go get something. So I won't pretend that you can do that on your own without another dog. You do need to train with somebody to fully teach your dog what that means. Um, secondly, you do need to do all the basics. You know, So the, the quickest way to get a steady dog is to you know, delay and deny. So throw a dummy out, walk the other way, do a lot of memories, teach dogs that you don't get to go get it just right now, and then do a lot of denials. If you have a dog that's struggling with steadiness, then pick half the dummies up. Uh, if you have a dog that's not struggling and is very steady and lacks in drive, then maybe you only pick up one out of 10 or one out of 12, you know, kind of read your dog on that. Um, but if you have a dog that they see a retrieve and they look like they're about to explode, then just tell them to sit and you walk out and pick it up. Uh, do a lot of remote marks where they've got to sit still while you throw it and wait on you when you're not sitting right next to them. Uh, yeah, all the steadiness drills, there's tons of them in Cornerstone. Just work those things a whole bunch. Um, try to put your dog in new environments around new people. And then thirdly, uh, when it you know when it comes to hunting your dog and honoring, I mean, I've seen dogs who are very steady that I would say, man, this dog is not going to break. And you take them on a hunt with another dog that does break, and all of a sudden the really steady dog starts to creep or even break. And I've seen it. I've actually been shocked by it. Like, man, I cannot believe that that dog broke. Um, but it does happen. So what I tell people is if you're going to hunt with someone who has an unsteady dog, either do not take your dog or just set your gun to the side and put your dog on a lead. Um, the worst thing is to let your dog run with another dog racing each other to the bird. Um, and so th those things may seem like a small deal when you're hunting, but they are lasting habits that can be very, very hard to correct later on. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, so 
one of the things that I'm thinking about, right, is on one hand, I see all these guys putting all this time in right now training with their pups. On the other hand, I know there's a lot of guys who this time of year is tough because like they're slamming their work schedule as much as they can, um, you know, so that they can have free time come hunting season. So, you know, those dudes probably don't have as much time to uh, spend working with their dog. And I know a lot of guys kind of really wrestle with the idea of sending their dog to a trainer. Um, you know, it's an option for them if they can't do it themselves and they're working or whatever it is, and but they want to get their dog ready to go for the season, you know, it's, it's an option to send it away to somebody and, and have them work with the, the pup. But, uh, you know, with that comes a lot of concern. So uh, kind of where do you weigh in on the fact on this area and sort of like what have you seen um, as far as some of the pros and cons of someone sending their dog to you or to whoever to train? And then when the owner gets the dog back, do you see – you know, they struggle to listen as well to the the original owner or um, are there complications that kind of enter into the scenario at times or are these just kind of things that people get worried about for uh, for no real reason? Man, it's just it's an interesting question to ask me. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, you're going to probably well, no, say, no, no, you know, no, but both you know, sides. I you've make, seen I you've seen it in real living. life, you know? Yeah, yeah. I make a living on people sending, you know, buying a dog and sending it back to training. But I also make a living on teaching people how to train their own dog. So it's an interesting conflict. You know, I want people to buy Cornerstone and do it yourself. But I have these trainers that work underneath Southern Oak Kennels that are fantastic. And I'm trying to convince people, you know, buy a dog and send it back to our trainer Um, or one of our trainers. So, yeah, I think it's definitely a both and in our culture. If you can train your dog yourself, if you know how to do it, if you're, you've got the time and the energy and the confidence, then go for it. You know, it's, it's an awesome, fulfilling thing. If you don't have those resources, the time, the energy, the know-how, uh, the confidence, the, even the space, if you don't have land, you know, access to water, the gear, all mm-hmm. that, it's not a cheap hobby, to be honest. Uh, if you don't have all that and you want to pay for someone to train it, then by all means do that. Labradors is really all I can speak to. Labradors and Springer Spaniels, but mostly Labradors. Man, they they adjust so well. I picked one up from the Oklahoma International Airport today, which doesn't even have a working gas pump. Um, a guy flew it in on a little Cessna. She's a six-month-old puppy from one of our litters, and like, and she shows up here and is immediately running around with other dogs her age, happy as a lark. You know, sometimes it takes them two or three days to adjust. And she'll go back home in five or six months after training with Wally and will go right back to the life she had, except now she knows how to do things. And they just adjust so quickly. Um, we're really big on training the trainer. We do recommend that all of our people that we train their dogs get cornerstones so they can at least see the drills that we're doing. Um, but we also have them, you know, it's a requirement if we train your dog that you come and work with us. The only times we've ever had like complete failures of dogs to adjust to a new owner, the literally only times we've had that happen are when we weren't able to work with that owner and their dog together and show them what to do. So it's a requirement now that you come in, we work some sessions, we show, you know, we show you everything. We make ourselves available to answer your phone calls, send you some videos, uh, help you along the way. And the handoff usually goes pretty well. I mean, people, the dogs adjust very quickly back. Um, I think some people worry about their dog like bonding with someone else, which I, I get it. But at that point, we're really humanizing our dogs. Um, I have an unbelievable bond with Red and Bruno and Kane for that matter. Like, I can be in a crowd of 500 people. I can take them to the, the my kids' baseball games, all three of them, and I do this often. And there's people everywhere. There's kids loving on them. There's people with pizza, nachos, all hot dogs, everything. <laughs> Those dogs do not take their eyes off me. I can walk 200 yards away to, to the concession stand, and they don't. I mean, kids petting them, everything, and their eyes are on me. And I didn't raise any of those dogs. They were all raised in another country by someone who spoke very differently and smelled differently and all that. And then they come over here. I'm the guy that feeds them. I'm the guy that trains them. I'm the guy that loves on them. And now they're you know, inseparable from me. Um, but I know that I could give them to any of you guys and you could do all the same things. Within a few weeks, they'd be your dogs and they'd be that way with you. And I'd walk up and they'd give me a glance and then they'd look right back at you. So they adjust very quickly. I wouldn't worry about those sort of things. Don't, don't humanize your dogs. Don't. 
you know, I get that a lot. Like, hey, I really want to send my dog, but my wife is terrified that they're going to forget us and forget the kids and all that. And I'm like, man, <laughs> even if they completely forgot the kids, they're going to re-remember them and re-love them as soon as they come back. You know, no problem. Um, so, I was yeah. going to say, I can, I could definitely speak to that because when we hunted together, trying to get a picture of red i had to know where you were at because he was he was looking at you the entire time so depending on what kind of angle i wanted to take a shot of him it it was solely based on where you were standing or walking around is kind of funny but uh definitely yeah i i can attest to that without a doubt (laughs) and that's Yeah. yeah you know that was one of you hear that every once in a while you know if my if I send a dog, then it's not going to listen. But, you know, Labradors, just the loving style that they have, you know, if someone pulls up to your house and opens up a door and starts calling them in, they're probably going to go check it out. You know, it's not like yep. they're, they're not, uh, they're not antisocial right. by any means. Right. So No, they're very social creatures. They love people. They love being a center of attention. They love getting loved on, but they'll, they'll replace that bond very quickly. Um, and they're just, uh, yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're fairly, uh, fairly easily adjustable in that sense. As long as they're well socialized, you know, do the work, socialize them. Um, and they should be fine with all that. Yeah. It's really about your lifestyle. You know, what's best for your lifestyle. It's the same thing with puppies and started dogs. You know, some people will buy a dog that's already got some training and bypass the puppy stage and that's cool. And some people will buy a puppy and that's awesome. Um, if you don't have the time for a puppy, don't get one. You know, if you have the time, then don't buy a starter dog. Go get a puppy and spend the time. Uh, it's just different strokes for different folks with all that. Without a doubt. So, you know, we hit on a lot of a lot, a lot of different subjects, and that's from you know either owning a dog or being on social media and seeing concerns from other people. But I'm sure you get other questions. Are there any other things, you know, especially during these months that you get a lot that should uh, our listeners should hear from you? Yeah, I think um, at this point, if you have a pup, you need to evaluate whether or not you're hunting your pup this coming year. Um, if you've got a young dog that was born in this calendar year, you know, I would encourage you to wait. I like to hunt dogs when they're at least a year, preferably like 15 months old. Um, and so I mentioned earlier on like getting your dog ready for the season, but if you have a dog that really doesn't need to be hunting this next season, then don't do that. You know, take your time, really make sure you build, no matter what you do, make sure that you really build that foundation, you know, that you're really laying the groundwork for what's going to be, you know, hopefully eight to 10 seasons of gun dog work. Um, so yeah, other than that, you just want to make sure that you're not overheating your dog and that you're having fun with it. And, uh, it's a, it's a pretty fun time of year. It's definitely gun dog training season. I agree with you guys. You get on the internet and it's just everywhere. Everybody's out doing stuff with their dogs, which is one of the reasons I got into it. I mean, I, I love dogs. I liked hunting because of the dogs. And then I realized I didn't have to just be like crazy about this two to three months of the year. I could extend the hobby across the entire year. We hunt them in the season and then we train them out of the season. So it never really stops. You know, of course it's fun killing birds. Don't get me wrong, but you know, our season's never really over. We just go from hunting season to training season. And, uh, that's, that's super fun. It's a super fun hobby. You know, I I wanted to just bring up something here before we, uh, before we part ways on this episode. And I'm sure Dan will have one more thing at least before we do, (laughs) but you know, you may, you may have heard rumor uh, that several weeks ago I posed Dan with a a life challenging question and, um, (laughs) He was unable to to make a, a, a call in the moment, but um, I, I want you to know that while Dan was letting you guys all flounder in the in the water, I was pulling you out because uh, I knew. No, I, that was that was who I would put in a boat with me. <laughs> okay, to I hunt. well, I figured the, I figured the drown the, the the flailing in the water was a little dark, so I, I changed up the the scenario, but. Um, yeah, I, I I drafted I drafted you on the onto the team, Barton. So uh, even okay. though Dan, even though Dan's not willing to commit, I am 
I'm I'm all in. So <laughs> he did. You know, Barton did come in on that and say, you know, he's the only one of those guys that was a uh, was a swimmer and a and that a I know swimmer. Of. So yeah. So, <laughs> but after this whole like trying to get back in shape and work out this summer, I'm not so sure if I should have said that. <laughs> to be honest with you guys. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I'm I'm good with it. It's a tough call. It's a tough call. <laughs> I yeah. wasn't. I wasn't offended. <laughs> <laughs> well, what uh, do you think, think, Dan? You got one more thing. Uh, one more thing would be, I believe, since last time we talked, um, the Southern Oak Kennel umbrella added another outpost. Yeah, man, I'd love to talk about that if we have just a, like a few seconds. I know we're pushing sure. time, but uh, yeah, we good. added Miles Durham, uh, which is the Fox Ridge outpost. Miles is in Madisonville, Kentucky. He's a phenomenal dude, one of the best dudes I know, to be honest, uh, and has become a really awesome gun dog trainer. And that's part of what we do is we find these guys and we help develop them. You know, Corey had only trained a handful of dogs underneath us when he brought on his outpost. And, you know, we let him work some of some of our dogs and uh, until he started, you know, proving that he could do it. And I let him work some of my personal dogs and then he would crushing it with those and then then we fed them a few client dogs and that's kind of how we do it with our guys is we let them grow underneath our umbrella we mentor them but we bring them in in a really organic way i mean these guys are already our friends usually they start off some sort of client relationship and then they're a friend and then we hunt together and then we train together and then we realize hey this is a really good fit so with southern oak we have the campuses which would have you know a handful of mama dogs and a handful of training dogs that would be like headquarters where I am currently that would be Saltillo where Brad is uh, SOK North where Don and Wally are that's our biggest campus other than me they, they do quite a bit up there it's a great spot and then we have a new one which is East which is Parish uh, in South Carolina and then we have Outposts which are guys who are our buddies and they have great jobs and they're not you know necessarily doing this full time but they are invested and learned and and they have one or two three mama dogs on the premises and then they train you know just a handful of client dogs at a time and that would be you know bracken creek with alex uh and then uh we mentioned Corey at tanglefoot trail which is here near me and then now miles at fox ridge so to be honest man this is how we've chosen to scale this business there's a lot of great gun dog kennels out there that produce a lot of really great puppies um and we appreciate those guys, and, and the more the merrier. You know, it's all good. And we just didn't want to necessarily pump too many puppies out of the same location. So instead of adding more females and more kennels, we decided to add more locations before we did anything. And to make sure that everybody, you know, all the dogs have a fair shot at, at being what you want to be as a Labrador. You know, they're not just stuck in a kennel and pumping out puppies. Uh, they're, they're running, they're being trained, they're hunting, they're a part of normal life. Uh, and then also occasionally having puppies, which is the way we want to do it. Yeah. Very cool. And then is are Don and Wally, are they building a new kennel? They are, man, I need to get up there and see it, but I don't have a kennel manager or hand right now. So I'm, I'm just kind of stuck here, but yeah, they are. Um, they are, uh, they've acquired f- several acres. I mean, literally two houses down from where the kennels are now phenomenal spot they're putting a technical pond in the back it's got water it's got land it's got hills it's got a flat field and then up near the front they're putting in uh indoor kennel facility and then they will start on like a lodge type building like we have here at this campus so man i'm so excited for those guys they're gonna be they're gonna have a you know a great spot they've already got an awesome spot and awesome training grounds but this this new addition is going to be just stellar so we're real excited Awesome. Yeah, I saw pictures of that, and I was like, "Ooh, they're moving yeah. on up." So it it looks yeah, sweet so far. It will be, and you know, Wally brings all of his dogs down here from, um, you know, February, like Valentine's Day to mid-April. He brings all his dogs down here and invades my all my spot. You know, like he lives here and is here, which is awesome. I really, it's awful when he leaves. I hate it, but <laughs> there's also like double the dogs here. You know. So I was like, good, I can't wait for you guys to build this. And I'm going to bring all my dogs up in the summertime when it's hot. And I'm just going to live at your place. So get ready. Get ready to receive me and return it because, uh, yeah, it's wild in the wintertime down here when Wally's here. That's awesome. 
Yeah, very cool. <clears throat> well, what do you think, Dan? Dude, that was, that was my one last thing. You know? Right. That's yeah. uh, good stuff going on. Appreciate the time and insight and a lot of a lot of good points you made tonight, so I appreciate it. Absolutely. Man, it's always fun talking to you guys and hopefully we will do it again soon and uh, I'm already looking forward to it. All right, man. Well, we appreciate it. And uh, until next time, we'll take it easy. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks again to Barton for joining us on the show this week. Uh, you know, he always always uh, goes hard in the paint. It's just a ton of great information. And it seems like you no know, matter what happens, you know, we, uh, you know, we go into an interview with him. We sort of got an idea of sort of the 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 you know the theme or some things that we want to talk about and inevitably we get pulled off track and we ask something that like is kind of off topic or you know we weren't anticipating and it seems like you know he just always has like a you know just can speak to whatever right you know it's never like you it's never you know you never stump him and it's not like he's like huh i didn't really thought about that you know it's, it feels like everything i've ever asked him you know in this context it's like always feel very well feels very uh well thought out and like you know n- you know he's probably just speaking from his experience, but to me, it feels like it's, you know, very well thought out and articulated. So it's, I think it just goes to show to, you know, his level of expertise and how he's really become just sort of a, you know, a student of the game, so to speak, to use that, you know, that term for whatever it's worth. And, uh, you know, just a guy that, you know, uh, has got it, got a lot, a lot of it figured out and has done a lot of great stuff. So always happy to have Barton on the show and uh, enjoy the information that he brings. Yeah. I would have to assume that majority of the questions we ask him, he's probably been asked 30 to 40 times, but <laughs> you know, to finally, finally get it recorded and put it out there for some other people that may not have a direct contact to him. So right. like you said, it's always good. Um, I really, I really don't have that much more to say, but I did want to say, like I said to, to you and him in there, but you know, happy father's day to all the fine gentlemen out there that, you know, take on that role and, you know, it's not always the easiest or, but it's, it's definitely worth it. So, you know, kudos to y'all and I hope, hope everyone had a great Father's Day weekend. Yeah. Likewise. It's, uh, you know, always cool to, to celebrate dad and, you know, being a dad now, it's fun to, to celebrate with, you know, the family and stuff. And it's always, it's always funny because my wife's like, what do you want to do for Father's Day? And I'm like, yeah, is it weird that I say I don't want to do anything? Like, I just want to just, I just want to hang out, you know, like not have to be responsible for taking care of anything. Just kind of hang out, play catch with my kid, you know, hang out with my daughter, whatever. It's all good. Pretty easy to please like that. But, uh, yeah, I said, I want to, I want to smoke some ribs this weekend and mm. I want my kids to, uh, wipe their own butt. <laughs> so we're at that stage. It's still, it's, it's to the point where they can do it and, you know, they're still hey, come in here, but no. It's so, it's time to change. So I that's think, my Father's Day present I that I want. I think we need to have a minor a minor intervention right now. M- All right, minor. You, you you gotta broaden your horizons a little bit on the smoker. I mean, you've been going to the rib well way too much. I mean, I I agree, it's, it's, but it's your it's, go to. I mean, mix it up. Come on, uh, <laughs> dude. I tell you what, I I cooked some steaks and chicken the other day, and it was a phenomenal. And I mean, the longest the longest you've smoked something is like. Like three or four hours for those ribs. Six, man. Three, two, one. Dude, that's nothing. Talk to no, me. I'm talk, not. Talk I need a brisket. You, you I need a brisket day. I, I would recommend before you go brisket, go pork shoulder. It's it's easy to do. You can't really screw it up. It's just a little bit longer time commitment. But just, you know, have pulled pork sandwiches for the whole fam. Money. So good. That's my recommendation. That's what I started with. And it, it's still one of my favorites but yeah see i started i started with the ribs and i and i have changed. it dialed in i know i have it dialed in but you've I'm done a couple whole chickens I, I, I should i should be fair you've done a couple whole chickens right yeah 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 and those are easy too yep. but the yep. uh so i you know easy peasy set it and forget it pretty much and and i'm happy i don't the one thing i don't want to do is mess something up on father's day right dude you're not gonna mess it up just heat you cook the temp cook the temperature <laughs> it's simple. Just check the temp, bro. Easy. Speaking of that, if I do, well, even if I do ribs, I need to get some more uh, pellets. I'm all, yeah, almost you need out. Some, you need so. some fuel, man. 
No doubt. Mm. All right. Anyway, that's the intervention. But maybe I'll smoke something. I did uh, pork tenderloin on How was uh, that? Memorial Day weekend. Dude, freaking fantastic. I did four yeah. of them. Oh, man, dude, they were so good. Yeah, I might even do that again just because it was so good. Yeah. The wife did a, one of those in a slow cooker the other day, and it was awful. Awful? It was, it was, it was in for too long, and yeah. and I was just like, oh, we should smoke that. So yeah. and she goes, I know. I put it in the morning and just tried to have it for dinner, and just too much, too much. I don't know what yeah. she did, but... yeah. I mean, like leave the, the leave the, pork, the cooking to me. Pork tender, all right. The pork tenderloins are right up your alley. They're quick. I mean, they're only yeah. a couple hours. I mean, you can easily smoke them in a couple hours. No big deal. So. I don't know what my, what the rib is. I don't know if it's all the barbecue or I don't know. Maybe I'll try something different. Probably not this I was weekend. Say, I mean, you, you made a big stink in the group <laughs> the one day about brisket and everyone's goes, you know, monkey poo over all this brisket talk. <laughs> and then it's like Monday. It's like, well, how was the brisket? And you're like, oh, I didn't do it. <laughs> I didn't do anything that weekend. I know. I didn't, oh, I didn't have time. I mean, I don't get it. Like you, you go into the weekend planning to do a, a brisket and which is an extremely long cook. And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I just didn't have time. It's like, <laughs> you got to kind of schedule it out if you're going yeah. to do brisket. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I, I get it though. You got a hundred kids. So it's like, it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> I have a hundred toddlers running around here. All, none of which wipe their butt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're officially off the rails. Uh, I'm not going to give you any more chances for one last thing. I do want to just take a minute to thank Gunner Kennels, 737 Duck and Goose Calls, Yukonuba, and Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource. They've got over 160 instructional videos that includes everything you need to take your seven week old puppy to a finished gun dog. Visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com to sign up for the free preview module and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. All right, that does it for episode 139. Thanks again to Barton Ramsey for joining the show and talking a little dog training with us and how you can maximize this summer season. If you're new to the show, head over to iTunes. You can check out all the past episodes there. While you're there, you can leave us a five star rating and review. We certainly appreciate it because it helps like-minded hunters just like you find our show. That's going to do it for this week. Until next week, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care.